How you doing, Prairie View? It's good to see all of you on Good Friday, or at least you can see me. I can't see you. Uh, for those who don't realize this, if you watch these videos later on YouTube, uh, these are actually Facebook Live videos. Uh, so if I mess up, then that means I mess up. Uh, if I stumble across my words, then I stumble over my words. Uh, but hopefully that adds a little bit of fun uh, to the Facebook Live videos and the YouTube videos that you watch. So uh, I wanted to just spend a few quick minutes with you on this Good Friday. Uh, as we mentioned in the video yesterday, uh, for several years now, we've been doing something special on the Thursday before Easter, uh, most of the time in the form of a prayer night. And that was not an option this year uh, for obvious reasons. So yesterday, the goal of the video devotion was to kind of make up for some of that lost opportunity uh, that we're missing with our usual prayer night. And today is kind of a different way of doing things. Uh, in the past, at our church, at least in my time here, we haven't done anything special on Good Friday. Uh, and I figured that, hey, you know what, this somewhat odd time that we're in where everything is disrupted and changed and interrupted uh, might even be a good time to try something new. Uh, so here we are. It's Good Friday, and we have a quick video devotion for you to consider. So on Wednesday, uh, we talked about Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Uh, if you've been attending our church for any period of time now on Sunday mornings, uh, you know that we've been in the Gospel of Mark. And so Mark 14 verses 1 through 11 is what happens on Wednesday leading up to Easter. And then yesterday we read Mark chapter 14 verses 12 through 72, uh, and that encapsulates what's happening on Thursday, what is sometimes referred to as Maundy Thursday. But again, today is Good Friday, uh, so we're going to discuss the events of the Friday before Easter Sunday in the Gospel of Mark, uh, and that is found in Mark chapter 15. And like we did yesterday, I'm not going to read all of the verses. Uh, it's one entire chapter uh, is what happens on Good Friday in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but instead, I'm just going to kind of summarize again, like we saw yesterday, three main scenes uh, where all the action seems to be taking place. Scene number one is in verses 1 through 20 of Mark 15, and that is Jesus before Pilate, or as some would argue, Pilate standing before Jesus. Scene number two is Jesus crucified, that's in verses 21 through 41. And then scene number three is Jesus' burial, uh, a few quick verses, verses 42 through 47. So we will briefly walk through each one of these scenes and then talk about what we learn, talk about maybe some of the takeaways that we get from Mark's account of Good Friday. So let's start with scene number one. Uh, that is Jesus standing before Pilate uh, in verses 1 through 20. And again, feel free to look at your Bibles as I'm summarizing this and uh, follow along. So we have Pilate. Uh, and Pilate is a Roman ruler with authority to enforce crucifixion. Uh, at the end of chapter 14, uh, the council, the religious leaders of the Jews, uh, came to their conclusion that Jesus deserved to be crucified because of his supposed blasphemy. Now, like we said yesterday, uh, Jesus did not commit blasphemy because what Jesus said was actually true. Uh, but nonetheless, the religious leaders are convinced that he is a blasphemer. Uh, they decide that he deserves to die. But here's the thing. The religious leaders do not have the authority, they do not have the jurisdiction to put Jesus to death. And so that's where Pilate comes in. The religious leaders drag Jesus before Pilate, hoping to get his okay to put Jesus to death. Now, as Jesus stands before Pilate, uh, you'll see, especially in verses 1 through 5, that Jesus really doesn't say a whole lot, uh, even though Pilate has the power to release him. Uh, he knows that the religious leaders have really cooked this whole thing up. Um, we read later a few verses, verse 10, that Pilate knows that the religious leaders did this out of envy. Uh, Pilate is a shrewd politician. He's probably had dealings with the Jewish religious leaders before. He knows how these guys work. Uh, and he is 
immediately skeptical of their intentions, of their motives, um, of the truthfulness of what they're saying. But he's reluctant to punish Jesus. Even though the religious leaders are pressuring him, Pilate just seems a little bit wishy-washy when it comes to punishing Jesus the way they want him to. In one of the other Gospels, we even read that Pilate's wife approaches him and says that she had a dream about Jesus and she just doesn't have a good feeling about putting this man to death. So Pilate is very, very reluctant. Uh, you can see him being pulled in many different directions. Uh, he wants to keep the peace and he doesn't want the Jewish religious leaders to cause a riot. But he also just doesn't quite feel right about what the religious leaders are saying and whether or not Jesus legitimately deserves death. So Pilate uh, essentially tries to manufacture a way out for Jesus. Uh, he brings up this yearly tradition of setting a prisoner free. Now, in this case, uh, that prisoner would be a man by the name of Barabbas. And we'll talk about the significance of Barabbas' name uh, here in just a few minutes. So Pilate proposes to the religious leaders, to the crowds that they're stirring up, that, okay, uh, if you want Jesus to be crucified, I will free Barabbas. Are you okay with that? Uh, Barabbas was a well-known murderer. Uh, he was notorious. His crimes were completely indefensible and undeniable. And these religious leaders and this crowd that they have stoked, they decide in their anger, in their passion, in their envy, that they would rather take their chances with a convicted, known, notorious murderer walking free. Uh, they'd rather take their chances with that than with Jesus walking free. And so that tells you just how unreasonable, that tells you just how emotional the religious leaders are and the crowd is. They have set their minds on Jesus being crucified, and they will not be satisfied until he is nailed to that cross, even if it means someone like Barabbas has to go free. So Pilate, eventually, after enough pressure, after enough deliberation, he gives in. Uh, he is driven by public opinion, he gives in to the pressure, and he sentences Jesus to crucifixion. The soldiers take him. Uh, this is in chapter 15, verses 16 through 20. They put the infamous crown of thorns on his head. They put a robe on him. They sarcastically refer to him as the king of the Jews, not realizing just how true their words actually are. And then they lead him out to Golgotha, where he will be crucified. And that takes you to scene number two we talked about uh, of Good Friday. That's verses 21 through 41 of Mark chapter 15. That is the crucifixion. Now, you may have heard this before, but crucifixion is a absolutely brutal way to die. Uh, in fact, there are some historians that say that the Romans would refuse to crucify their own citizens uh, because of how cruel, because of how gruesome it was. Uh, so crucifixion was an awful, awful, awful way to die. Uh, the way you die if you were crucified was some combination of asphyxiation uh, and then, of course, shock. Uh, you would often go into cardiac arrest. And then there's the blood loss that Jesus had already sustained from the beatings and the mocking and the flogging. And so crucifixion is an absolutely horrible way to go. But as Jesus is crucified in verses 21 through 41, there is one passage of scripture that really seems to stick out, that makes repeated appearances, and that is Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a psalm of David, and just a few examples of where Psalm 22 comes into play in the crucifixion. So for example, when they divide his garments, when the soldiers split up his clothes before they strip him, that's a reference to Psalm 22. We see the next reference to Psalm 22 when it says in verse 29 that those around them were wagging their heads at Jesus in their way of mocking him. That is also a reference to Psalm 22. And then maybe the most obvious one, uh, the most famous reference to Psalm 22, is Jesus' cry as he dies on the cross. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Psalm 22 just keeps popping up in the crucifixion of Jesus. And like any good psalm, uh, Psalm 22 is both a psalm of lament, but it's also a psalm of confidence in God. We've talked about that before at Prairie View, how uh, so many of the psalms walk this very fine line. They have this very delicate balance between honest, open, vulnerable, transparent expression of grief and anger and doubt. But they're also counteracted, these psalms, by expressions of confidence, expressions of faith. Uh, It's almost like the psalmists, as they're writing these words, are fighting this inward battle of doubt and fear and frustration on the one hand, with faith and confidence and trust in God on the other hand. Uh, That's true in so many psalms. It's definitely true in Psalm 22. uh, And it's true of what Jesus is experiencing here. Jesus is in excruciating pain. Uh, The word excruciating actually comes from crucifixion. Crucifixion, excruciating. And so Jesus' expression of pain, of frustration, is very, very real. But we also should not take it as an expression of doubt. Uh, Jesus knew that the Father loved him. Uh, Jesus knew that he was fulfilling the scriptures. Jesus knew that he was obeying the Father's will. And Jesus knew that God would deliver him from death. So Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 in both senses, uh, the expression of lament, but also confidence, faith, trust in the Father. So then we get to Jesus' death. That is in verses 33 through 41. Again, all of this taking place on Golgotha. And it's so interesting. It's, It's when Jesus dies that you see those Uh, details that so many of the Gospels contain. Uh, The detail like the curtain being torn in two from top to bottom. Uh, How does a curtain tear from top to bottom? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, Well, it doesn't have to make any sense, uh, at least naturally speaking, uh, because it is a miracle. It is a divine intervention when that curtain tears in two. The curtain is representative of the distance between God and man. Uh, That curtain was kind of the line of demarcation uh, from where the common could not enter into the presence of the holy. But here we see that curtain being torn in two. Uh, We saw yesterday and Wednesday and Tuesday even uh, some of Jesus' words on the temple, how the temple was failing to bear fruit like that fig tree he cursed. Uh, The temple had been turned into a den of robbers or a den of rebels. And so here we see that Jesus is ultimately becoming the temple himself. Uh, Jesus is the means by which sinners enter into the presence of God. And that is symbolized by that curtain being torn in two from top to bottom. And then at Jesus' death, we also see these interesting words uh, from the centurion who was basically overseeing his execution. We see in verse 39, the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, and he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Back in verses 16 through 20, the Roman soldiers sarcastically referred to Jesus as the king of the Jews, but here we have the centurion referring to Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, The Roman soldier overseeing this crucifixion refers to Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, That is just very striking uh, when you read this passage. And then finally, that brings us to scene number three. Uh, At this point, Jesus has died. The centurion has seen it. And then we get to verses 42 and 47, uh, and that is Jesus' burial. These verses move really quickly. Uh, There's not a whole lot of detail paid to Jesus' burial. There are a few interesting quips, though. So, for example, we read that Joseph of Arimathea uh, is the man who provided the tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea is a respected member of the council. 
Now that's interesting because it's the council that dragged Jesus before Pilate. Uh, but we read that Joseph of Arimathea dissented uh, in the council's decision. Uh, other gospels even go so far as referring to Joseph of Arimathea as a disciple of Jesus. Uh, that is certainly interesting. And we see that a council member uh, is the one who provides Jesus this honor of being buried in a new tomb. Uh, we see that a council member is the one who sticks his neck out there and goes to Pilate uh, to request Jesus' body so that it could be buried before Saturday, the Sabbath. Pilate grants the request. Who knows? Maybe Pilate was feeling a little bit of guilt at this point, uh, knowing what he had done, that he had violated his own conscience in sentencing Jesus to death. And Jesus' body is put in that tomb. Uh, verse 47 of chapter 15 specifically notes that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus was laid. Uh, and that will come into importance in verse 16, chapter 16, rather, on Sunday morning. For those who think that maybe the women went to the wrong tomb, uh, Mark makes it pretty clear in chapter 15, verse 47, that no, they knew the right tomb. They knew where Jesus was buried. So those are kind of the three big scenes uh, that we see in Mark chapter 15, uh, Mark's account of what happened on Good Friday. Typically, uh, we have different takeaways from this. Uh, one of the beautiful things of the four Gospels is that each one of them is unique and you can learn something different from each one. And then one thing that's also interesting is how you can come to the same texts of Scripture over and over again, and you can get different takeaways. Uh, that's not so much because Scripture has changed. Uh, it hasn't, uh, but it's because we change. Um, our experiences change. Our thoughts change. Uh, so much changes about us. And so when we open Scripture anew, um, it's sometimes like we're reading it for the first time, even if we've read these stories before. And so for me, as I looked at Mark chapter 15 today, uh, again, a chapter I've read before, um, I did come away with one big takeaway. And the big takeaway that I came away with is that Good Friday is a day of ironies. It's a day of ironies. Uh, so for example, it's, it's ironic. You look at Jesus and Pilate's conversation. Uh, who looks more like the ruler in that conversation? Is it the cowardly, easily influenced Pilate? Or is it the righteous Jesus? According to worldly standards, Pilate is the ruler uh, in that conversation. And yet, I think we know that's not really the case. Uh, so it's ironic that Jesus stands before Pilate. And as we said a few minutes ago, some people prefer to refer to it as Pilate standing before Jesus because Jesus is the real ruler here. We see the irony that this man, Barabbas, goes free. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago we would talk about the significance of Barabbas' name. Uh, Barabbas can often be translated as son of God. And so here we have the so-called son of God, uh, son of God in name only, this guy Barabbas, walking free. And yet here we have the real, true, authentic, holy son of God being condemned. You just cannot help but see the irony of Barabbas walking free, and yet Jesus is being condemned. The murderer walks free, and yet the holy righteous one is killed. And really, I think you can look at Barabbas and you can see yourself. I can look at Barabbas and I can see myself. Uh, because the story of Barabbas and Jesus is really the story of every sinner, that the evil, wicked sinner walks free because of what the true, real, righteous, holy Son of God did, and that is subjecting himself to condemnation, subjecting himself to crucifixion. It's ironic that when Jesus dies, uh, the sky is dark in the middle of the day, it's ironic that as the religious leaders wag their heads at Jesus, as they mock Jesus, they ask Jesus to perform the one miracle that he will not do, 
and that has come down from the cross. They've seen miracles. They've seen healings. They've seen demons outcast. They've seen Jesus walk on water. Uh, they've heard of Jesus and seen Jesus healing people on the Sabbath. Uh, they've seen their fair share of miracles. This is not a genuine request on their part. Um, and yet when they mock him, they seem to insist, maybe seriously, maybe sarcastically, that if Jesus will just come down, then that would be the one thing that would finally make them believe in him. Uh, but that probably wouldn't be true. In their hardened hearts, in their willful ignorance, they would find some way to get around it. They would probably once again attribute Jesus' power to the power of Satan. They had already did that once in the Gospel of Mark. And so the one thing that they want Jesus to do that will supposedly make them believe is the thing that Jesus will not do, and that is come down from the cross. Because to come down from the cross would be disobedient to the Father's will. To come down from the cross uh, would not fulfill the scriptures, uh, like we talked about yesterday on Maundy Thursday. So it's ironic, isn't it? And then we also see the irony in the centurion's confession. Truly, this is the Son of God. Um, of all people who are standing there at the crucifixion uh, to make this honest confession of who Jesus is, it's the Roman soldier who's overseeing the whole event. Uh, what an irony that is. And then we even see this irony that a member of the council that condemns Jesus is ultimately the one that honors Jesus with a proper burial. Again, ironies abound uh, in Good Friday. And I actually find myself thinking about a conversation I had with someone in our church uh, not too long ago, a few weeks ago, where we were talking about Good Friday and they said, you know, do we mourn or do we celebrate Good Friday? Uh, and the answer is yes, we do both uh, because it is a day of ironies. And that's why we can mourn and celebrate at the same time. We mourn the thought of our Lord experiencing the kind of suffering and pain that he experienced uh, on the Friday before Easter. But we also celebrate because we know that his death was not just a tragic misstep. It was not uh, an unfortunate set of coincidences. Uh, Jesus's death is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Jesus's death is an obedience to the Father. Jesus's death uh, is his way of fulfilling that promise he made in chapter 10, verse 45, that he would give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, that's what is happening here at Jesus's death. And so in that sense, we celebrate it. We celebrate that Jesus's death means our life. We celebrate that Jesus's condemnation means our justification. We celebrate that the sinless one, Jesus Christ, died for sinners, people like you and people like me. So we do celebrate Good Friday, uh, even though it is a day of ironies, even though it is a day that our Lord and our Savior suffered. In that sense, we grieve, but we also celebrate because this is the day of our salvation. Uh, this is the day when Christ laid down his life as a ransom for many. Historically, some Christians were known to answer the question, you know, when were you saved? Uh, when did you get saved? And some of those Christians would say, I was saved in 33 AD. That's when I got saved, uh, referring to Jesus's death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And I think there's some truth, and I think there's some wisdom to that sort of response. Uh, Good Friday, some 2,000 years ago, is the day of our salvation. It's the day that Jesus took the righteous wrath of God against sin on his shoulders. It's the day that Jesus died in the place of all who would believe in him. It's the day that he poured out his blood for many in order that we might be reconciled to the Father, in order that we might be forgiven in order that we might become sons and daughters of God rather than just enemies or rebels. So, in that sense, we celebrate Good Friday. Now, Saturday in the week of Easter is a very quiet day. Uh, we know nothing about Saturday from what we read in the Gospels. It's a quiet day. Uh, at that point, Jesus is dead, 
Uh, I'm sure the disciples are regrouping and even panicking, uh, trying to find out what comes next. Uh, but we know what comes next. We know what happens on Sunday. And so on Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, we will talk about what we read in Mark chapter 16. Uh, that'll be our sermon on Sunday morning at Prairie View. We encourage you to be a part of it. Uh, we'll have it up on our website. We'll put it on YouTube. Uh, we'll also email the MP3 out to our congregation uh, from Nancy. So that covers our Good Friday devotion. Uh, again, it's a day of ironies, a day that we grieve as believers, but also a day that we celebrate as believers because we know what happens on Sunday. So with that, I hope you have a good rest of your Good Friday. Uh, consider who Christ is and what Christ did for you as recorded in Mark chapter 15. And we hope that you will be back with us on Sunday morning to talk about the resurrection.